So Mickey and I are going to talk to you about the process that we take to develop a website. We're not getting nitty gritty into coding. We're going to stay high level and just talk through the phases that we go through. Um, a little bit about us. Um, Mickey and I are co-owners of Green Melon Media. We're an agency in Marietta. Uh, we've got an, a studio off the square, and most of our team is sitting right there, and I don't see the last number. But we're a team of five, and um, WordPress development is our core. Um, outside of that, we do print design, branding, messaging, SEO, uh, some strategy, some social management and strategy as well. Uh, so we've been in business about six years now, and um, we actually host a meetup called All Things WordPress in Marietta, uh, in the library. It's the, supposed to be the third Thursday? Yeah, it bounces around. Bounces around a little bit. Lunchtime, the third Thursday of, of every month. Um, we actually cover a lot of the things we're talking about today in more detail at the meetup, so we'd love to have you guys. Yes, All Things WordPress. And there's, yeah, you can actually go to allthingswordpress.com and it'll redirect to our website there. Yeah. Um, so our process that we use for web design isn't one that is necessarily universal. It's certainly, there's going to be different approaches. Um, we're just going to show you what we do. What we're we're going to share what we do. Uh, freelancers might dive in, you know, a little bit uh, more high level. Um, big agencies probably go even deeper. Uh, the process can involve, ours involves up to seven people sometimes, so it's, it all depends on who you have on deck um, to help you out. Um, so first, consider this quote. A well-trained man uh, knows how to answer questions, and an educated man knows what questions are worth asking. So whenever we approach a website design, um, it, it's always about educating the client um, and not diving straight into design or diving straight into what do you want it to look like? Um, it's about asking the right questions and educating them. Um, so many of you have probably been asked a lot of questions. How many of you are designers? Okay, awesome. Developers? A combination of the two? Awesome, awesome. Um, so you guys are probably presented with a lot of questions from your clients um, quite often. So things like, you've never heard this, how much do your websites cost? <laughs> Yay. Um, and if you saw Jason Swank yesterday, he has a good answer for that. If people, if, if you ask them what their budget is and they say, well, we don't really have a budget, they don't want to realize it, great, we can build a killer website with unlimited funds and new testing and usually that will hone it back in. Um, the better, better thing I like to raise is kind of a range. If, if someone has a budget and budget is their top concern, then GoDaddy has a plan for a dollar a month you can build a website. You know, so if you want to do budget all the way down. Going the other way, you have people, uh, if you were here at WordCamp a couple years ago, uh, Cody Benson from Georgia State did the keynote. They did their new website on WordPress. It was greater than a million dollars. Um, other sites, um, what do we have, B&Q, uh, Home Depot in the UK did a new website for $88 million. The government built one for like $2 billion, and it's, you know, not any good. So really, the range, the range can be all over. Um, and you can look at Wix and Squarespace and some of those for four bucks or eight bucks or free, and sometimes that's a good solution, but honing in on budget can be tough. Um, and that question, of course, is hard to answer because you, you know, I'm sure if we go around the room, really what we build sites for, it varies, you know, depending on what people need. Uh, the next question we get a lot, can you include a design prototype with the proposal or give me a, a sketch of what we're going to do? And we say, no, we can't. Um, again, in some cases you can, it comes down to price. If you go to GoDaddy, the first thing you do is pick a theme because you want to go. But back to Allie's quote, if you want to do it right, we believe in taking your time thinking through the, the process of it. What needs to happen? What should the customers do? And, and laying it out. And we're going to walk through some of that. Um, and in general, we feel the quicker you do design, the cheaper the site is. And the less effective, but cheaper too. Again, a GoDaddy for a dollar, you do design. It's cheap, maybe good, less effective. Further down, when we go through our process, design's not until step seven really thinking through what's going on. And there's, of course, places in the middle. Um, another question. I need a website at the end of the month. Um, and that's possible, too. And I know some of you guys can do it that fast. In theory, we could, too. But again, to do it right, the way we want to do it, takes usually 12 weeks, maybe more, depending on other features that come in. Um, at times, we try to say, OK, they really do need it in a month for this conference. Let's just skip some steps and make it happen. And it just never goes as well. Things just aren't thought through, and pieces are missed. Um, again, there may be cases for it, but we really believe in, in following the process. You know, we have this, we've built it over the years, and we, we like to trust, trust the process. So we love what we do. People come to us with all sorts of ideas. They say, okay, here's what I want it to look like, or here's what I need to sell, here's what I need to 
you know, to put out there to the world. Great, you know, there's certainly a million different ways we can do that, and a website is one of those. Um, so we take those ideas um, that they come to us with, and we turn it into a strategy. Um, and, and we're able to turn the conversation around and say, all right, let's start square one. Take it one piece at a time. So that's where we start. Uh, we say, okay, guys, let's, let's talk about your goals. Let's look at really what the goal of this website is and what we want to accomplish. Um, so like I said, we're going to focus one step at a time and really dive in. Um, the first thing that we do is discovery. How many of you have a discovery meeting with your clients? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a given, right? Uh, what questions do you ask? You know, who's doing the most talking? Um, and that goes back to my quote, a, a well-educated man knows what questions to ask. Um, so we start, we actually, before we, before we even have a conversation with the client, we send them an online questionnaire. And it gives them a chance to write their thoughts down um, and really dig deep into what they're looking at executing and accomplishing on the site. And having this form, having this, you know, this well thought out discussion gives us, gives us something to talk about during our discovery meeting to dig in deeper. Um, so we talk about goals. We talk about their target audiences. Sometimes they say, our audience is everybody. No, no, it's not. Um, then it's nobody. So you know, that's, a, that's a process we can go through as well. You know, let's, let's narrow down your target audience, and that's messaging strategy. Um, your competition, it's always good to do a competitive audit uh, of other websites in the industry just to stay abreast of what is happening um, so we can make sure we're that much better. Uh, the features of the site are going to be, you know, some people come to us with a wish list of features, and that's okay. You know, we'll consider those features, and then we kind of st step back, think through them, and suggest the best, uh, the best execution um, to, make it, to make it work. Uh, we had a meetup last, two weeks ago now? Yeah, something like that. Um, all, th our all Things WordPress meetup, where we actually dug really deep into these questions, and you can go to our website or allthingswordpress.com and get those slides so you can see what questions that we ask. So the next step after we really regroup and Mickey and I parse through our notes and think through what are we going to do to accomplish this goal is we define the project. Um, we, we really think through those features and spell it out into essentially a scope of work. Um, but we make sure the client agrees with us on that scope of work. It's a working document. Uh, it's, it's something that we present to them and say, this is our suggestion. Uh, if you went to Jason Blummer's talk or have read any of his books, um, he's got a really great suggestion for presenting this, this proposal of sorts. He always says give three options. Uh, one, it makes you your own competition. They're comparing you to you because you've given them options. Um, it also gives them a range. You know, This is our full, most robust solution that we really think is going to work for you. It might be over your budget. But consider it, because this is what we're suggesting to make it work. The second option might be something that's a little more scaled down and within their comfort zone. Um, might not be as robust and you know, full, full featured as the first one. And the last one might be the, if you really need something, here's what we can do for you, you know, for, for that baseline. Uh, so once we all agree on that project, on that scope, uh, we can move on to actually collecting the assets that we need to do the job right. Um, most, you know, a lot of companies have a logo, an existing logo, or an existing style guide that we need to make sure we abide by. Um, we like to collect inspiration, uh, not because we want to do what the client wants. You know, they might have an idea of what the website looks like, but they're going to turn to us for that, for best practices there. But we don't want to disappoint. We want to at least get inside of their heads. So whether it's a magazine cutout that they like the colors on, or another website, um, you know, we want to see that to start really shaping what they see in their head to make sure that we can at least, you know, accomplish something and not disappoint. Um, hosting is another item that we always want to make sure is um, in place. And Mickey can talk a little bit about um, our beliefs there. Yeah, so for hosting, I've talked to a lot of you individually this week about how you host sites. Our philosophy personally is to let clients always host their site. We'll help them get it set up and let them pay for it, them own it. We'll take care of all the dirty work. Um, and we think that works out best for them. I've talked to some of you that host on behalf of your clients and have very good reasons for doing that. So, again, I'm not going to say our way is best um, necessarily. Uh, we, we, we like working that way, mostly to give our clients freedom. You know, we're in the middle of a project with a client right now. We've been a month just trying to get access to their site because they didn't have control of it. The previous guy did, and he has a job now, and he's going to get to it eventually. And meanwhile, you know, you can't do anything about it. You know, the hosting 
certainly rightfully won't give anyone else access because it's his account. So we don't, we don't ever want to be that person where they're stuck with us because of that. Um, but other folks, we talked to a guy last night, he hosts like 400 sites, so it's always on their platform because it's hard to deal with that many. So, I mean, there's good reasons there as well. Claudia. Yes, so she's asking, do we walk them through it? Yes, we do. Um, depending on their needs, and a lot of them will come with hosting already. They'll say, I already have an account with HostGator, ClickHost, someone decent, um, they're good with that. You know, there's SiteGround, DreamHost, you know, lots of decent hosts out there, you know, for depending on your budget. You move up to WP Engines and others, depending what's going on. But yeah, I've even, like I talked to Carl Becker at ClickHost a few years ago and said, hey, I have clients trying to sign up, but step two is confusing. Go change that a little bit to make it easier. And so now he has a number. So I can tell clients, go to ClickHost, click on the whatever option, then click number two on the next page, and it makes it easier to go through. So yeah, because it is a tricky piece. I don't want to make them do work, but I want it in their name, their control, their credit card. And then when I say, after you sign up, you're going to get an email full of gobbledygook you don't know about with FTP and IP addresses. Just send that to us and we'll deal with it. But then if they ever decide they don't like us and want to move on, they have control and can, can do their own thing. So yeah. kind of our thoughts there. Yeah. So now that we have everything that we need to really make this stuff start working. Uh, we dive into exactly what pages need to be on the site in order to accomplish their goals. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier today at 9 a.m. Uh, the goal is the main overarching uh, thought that you need to keep in your mind through this entire process. How are, when, it, when a user comes to your site, what action needs to happen? What is the call to action? What, what does conversion mean? Um, so coming up with a site map helps outline exactly what hierarchy of pages and um, actions are going to happen through the site. We outline these pages in a flow chart. Um, and if you're doing key, keyword research, this is the phase where it really needs to start. Uh, a lot of those keywords uh, need to be in your pages. And if you're able to define that list of keywords that you're going after, we can take, in, we can take that into account when creating uh, the sitemap. We use a pretty cool tool called Slick Plan to do our sitemaps. This is an example of a sitemap. It looks kind of like a flow chart. Um, we explain to our clients each little bubble, each little box is a page. And we want to make sure at this point every single page is accounted for um, before we dig in so there's no surprises down the road. Um, and this is just part of really strategically thinking through what's, what's going to be on the site. It also helps with content development and copywriting. Once we outline this flow chart, we know exactly where content's missing, what needs to be written, and the copywriter can say, okay, well, I've got you know, 24 pages to write, let's get started. Um, it also helps the client, you know, if, if the client's trying to really think through what pages need to be offered, what their services are, this is the time to really dig in and talk about that deeper. Um, let's see, we used to use Illustrator when doing site, ma site maps, just, you know, making little boxes and outlining it for them. Slip Plan has some really neat tools. You can add annotations uh, for each, each page to say exactly what features need to be on that page or an overview of the content that should be on that page. You can export it as a PDF and that will um, keep those little notes in there so the client can approve a PDF rather than having to go into Slip Plan and really poke around that way. Um, so content, once the sitemap is defined, content is our next step. We know what to write now. Um, so this is when we, it's not only, you know, of course, keywords, we want to make sure those keywords are integrated into the content. Um, Jenny Munn talked about that yesterday. And she's, uh, she'll, she'll tell you every time, any page that you write, you want to make sure those keywords are strategically placed through it. So that, that comes into account right now when we're working on copy. Um, we also want to collect any images at this point. Sometimes people like to make a mood board to help create a catalog of images to use on the site that, that express that same feeling, that, that communicate uh, visually uh, what, the, what the website's trying to accomplish. And video, uh, we need to make sure that if there's any video to be included on the site, we need to know about it now so we can integrate it onto the pages correctly. And uh, of course, if you need to get video created, let's back up a little bit and get that done. So that's something that we would have talked about in the, in the discovery process. Um, content is our biggest bottleneck, personally. Whenever we're working on a website, if, we're, if we don't have an experience or if we don't have a copywriter uh, and, the, and the client's trying to provide content, it's undoubtedly going to be a bottleneck in our process. And we can end up waiting months for content because they don't, it's, you think you can take on, you know, a full site map of, of pages and copy, and it ends up taking so much longer than you expect. So I do suggest investing in a good copywriter uh, when doing your website. 
Jill was asking how many times that we're asked, can you show me the design first so I can write copy around it? Um, which, yeah, I know, we could ask it too. A copywriter is really gonna be able to work with you um, on creating that editorial strategy on the website, but when a client wants to see that, it's tough. Um, we try to educate them on how the messaging is really going to impact the design. Uh, the headlines, I mean, headlines on each page is just as relevant um, as the design is itself. So if there's a headline about cats, we wanna make sure that the design of the page is, you know, it's gonna play off of each other. We love having copywriters in house or ours is right next door to our office because we can collaborate on that and do those internal meetings um, and kinda get on the same page together. It's tough when it's disjointed, you know. It is, it is a challenge. Then I was going to say one other thing. You'll notice, too, that we're doing content. We haven't even gotten to design, development, all that stuff, because this isn't going to be done now. This is going to start and sort of be going alongside as we work through the rest of the steps, because it does take a while. Oh, and one more thing for Jill. Yeah. Um, the next step is wireframing, right? Well, after. Oh, after yeah. content color. Yeah, our next step is wireframing, and it, that helps as well with content. If something's going to be, if a page is going to be more graphically driven and more and more internal pages are not just content, you know, there's going to be a bit of a, you know, like a second homepage uh, just to really get some of that information because uh, anybody can land on any page of your site. So we tend to wireframe deeper into the site in order to lay out. This is how we're seeing the content being laid out and that might help as well. And we'll get there in a second. All right, so related to content, um, we picked this up, I think it was a couple years ago here with Andrew Searles, uh, but we used something called a content collector that we've built. Um, which is kind of, kind of cool. I know some of you want some more tools to build or to use, and so this is a neat idea. Uh, so what we have, we set up a WordPress multi-site, which in and of itself can be a little tricky. Your host can probably help you with that. Um, in our case, it's greenmelon.cc. It's just a boring page if you pull it up. But we build a little multi-site for every client, um, and that's where we can load the content. It's just a simple WordPress, no, no muss, no fuss. They can load content onto while we're building the real site. Uh, and what's neat is the way it works with Slick Plan. So Allie has her slick plan. She's drawing the bubbles in there and making notes. You can take slick plan and say export to WordPress, import that into our content collector, and it automatically generates all the pages in the menu. It takes the notes from slick plan and puts them in the body of the pages. So then when the copywriter goes in, all the pages are laid out. Everyone has the notes, and she can say, okay, there were the notes, the keywords. Start building them out. The site's being developed. When the site's done, we're already on a WordPress site, so we can do an export and then import that into the site, and all our content is suddenly on the, the dev site that's about to go live. So. Indeed. In need of form, yeah, it still needs to be cleaned up because, again, it's, it's bare bones there, but at least it saves us a lot of copying and pasting and setting up pages and that kind of stuff. It, it works pretty well. So, Is that your own plugin or what? Is, go well, okay, yeah, it's not our own plugin. It's Slick Plan, slickplan.com is the product we use there, and they have the export tool to WordPress. WordPress multi site is, we had to set up a site for that, but it's a common, it's admittedly a little tricky to set up, but it's a, a common thing. You can talk to folks about that. So we set up our own WordPress multi site. But the plug, there's already a plugin for Slick Plan to do the import into there. Um, and then it's just the normal WordPress export out of one and import into our development site. And, and this, we, typically use, we typically use Content Collector when we're working with the client to gather the content. A copywriter, we have a bit more of an internal process for accepting their files and everything. Um, we, Mickey will send a screencast of, exact, of walking through Content Collector and how to, add a page, how to add content to a page so the client understands Okay, I log in, click on pages, and I go to you know the page that I want to write content for, and I dump my content there. Save, publish. You know, it's not an indexed um, site, so it can you know they just publish away, and that's just how we ask them to submit content to us. Yeah, and then we because one of the issues, of course, we all have is they submit their content and they say, oh, but here's a change, reload it again. Oh, and I change this other one, reload it again. And so this way they can reload it to their heart's content until they say it's done. We say good, it's done. Let's let's move it over, and that saves. Because we always tell people, send us final copy, and we all know that it doesn't happen. <laughs> but this way, they can do that. They can load their final copy, and then load their final, final copy, and then final copy version three, and you know they can do all that, and it doesn't affect us. We can just move it over. Any other questions at this point? Awesome. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, content collector is our word. We call it our content collector. 
Slick Plan just has a, a, they call it like an XML export into any WordPress site, which happens to be into our content collector multi-site, um, and then run it over yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. That was something we created. Yeah. But the, the tools to make that happen are all freely available, though. So now that we're kind of behind the scenes, we're working on content, that's going to keep on going behind the scenes. You know, that's not a, it's, you know, it's not just write it up and it's done. So we're going to move on to architecture. We call it architecture because a lot of our clients don't understand the word wireframes, but this is wireframe. Um, we, we had it as, our, as wireframing for such a long time, and every pitch that we ever did was essentially, well, here's what a wireframe is. So um, we call it architecture so we can explain that it's the blueprint that we draw before building the house. Um, so you would never just start nailing together boards to build a house without having a plan. Um, so this really helps us with usability and what I was talking about before with the site plan, um, thinking through the call to action and the best way to get there. Um, so we do this specifically not only to plan, but also to help the client make decisions without getting distracted by color and pictures and shapes. Um, we just want them to see the bare bones of what we're thinking for um, the layout of each page so they can approve that and then we can wrap it in design. So we're getting close to design, but we're still planning. Um, this really, the way I think of it, after I have my site plan laid out and I know the main uh, goals and call to action, those are my puzzle pieces. And then I go in and I start arranging them in different ways and sketching and brainstorming, looking at other sites for inspiration until I come up with what I think is going to accomplish some conversion, you know, a call to action. And I usually have two to three options, uh, but mostly for the home page, and I'll present that first. And then the client can choose, you know, I'm really liking how this one has, you know, the big headline at the top, but can we bring the video up too, you know? And I let them kind of say, here's what I'm thinking, and we offer our suggestions from there. So it helps them to envision how the site's gonna look without completely seeing it in its full form yet. Um, we use Illustrator, and you can see an example of this is just our website, a bare bone wireframe of the home page. I use Illustrator. There's a lot of tools out there. There's Balsamic, um, Gliffy. Gliffy, yeah. There's a few that we've tried. I am very comfortable in Illustrator just with my background in print, so it's just what I go to. Um, and this is what they'll see. And you know, we make sure we're getting headlines right. At this point, I'd like the copywriter to start giving us some input on headlines and calls to action because I can start integrating them into our wireframe. Yeah. So once the client chooses uh, the wireframe that they like, and we'll actually go on and build you know, an internal wireframe, depending on how complex the project is. You know, we've done up to 20 wireframes. Uh, we, then do, we then can start doing design. And this is, it's, it's going to be an easier process now that we have the layout of the site. Um, so we essentially color inside the lines or outside the lines or however you want to do it. And um, it's, now the client knows what to expect. We've set expectations, and um, when they start seeing it come together, they get really excited. They see, oh, now I see it, why we went from here to here to here to design. Um, we give the client a chance to review the, des the design. Uh, of course, there's a revision process here, just like there is on every other step that we've gone through, uh, to make any necessary changes before we move on to development. So then, yeah, development. So we've gone this far, and they still have nothing technically resembling a website at all, just some pictures and layouts and stuff. So it's time to get started digging in. Um, and again, this could be a whole day talk in and of itself. And I'll, I'm sure you've been to some other presentations on frameworks and development practices, and I don't want to get into that too much. Um, personally, we use the Genesis framework, Studio Press, those folks. Um, that's more a little tech heavy if you want to really design it. There's others like Divi that are more drag and drop, you know, depending where your skills are, that kind of thing. Um, other frameworks you guys like to use for sites? Nobody? Yeah. What's that? Thesis. thesis, yeah, Thesis is a popular one. Um, other developers might use Bootstrap, something like that. But again, that's sort of inconsequential to the talk, but yeah, we do use Genesis for that. Um, yeah, and get going through there. Once it's developed to a point, we put it up on a staging server. Uh, this will depend on whether they already have a site or not. If they haven't had a website before, we'll go ahead and put it on their real site with a coming soon page on it. Um, and I usually let Google go ahead and index that because all Google will see is the, the main home page but can start getting a little bit of juice going there. Um, if they already have an existing site, we'll put it on a test, test server with a different domain name and tell Google to stay away. We don't want to mess, mess up their rankings in the meantime. Uh, but wherever it is, we go in and start playing. Um, I was going to mention on the coming soon page, we talked about this at the earlier session, but we use a plugin called Ultimate Coming Soon Page. 
um, which works well for that. What's neat is you can build a little coming soon page, and if anyone's logged into the site, they don't see it. It's just a normal site with a home page and everything. Anyone that's not logged in, which is everyone else, they just see the coming soon page. So it works well. Client can log in, and it works just like the final site will, except no one else can see it. Um, but wherever it is, at that point, it's time to start playing with it. And um, t there's a plugin called Viewport Resizer on Chrome that you can use just to kind of test different mobile sizes. Um, thumbs up in the back for that. It's a, it is a good little plugin. Ashley told, shared with us a while ago. You still want to test it on as many mobile devices as you can because the size of an iPhone is not always exactly the same as how an iPhone will treat it. Um, different browsers. Um, I happen to use Windows, which is very helpful at this point because I have Internet Explorer, which hate it, which we all do. A lot of people still use it, so you have to have to be able to test on that. Um, sure. Uh, the plugin, I believe, is called Viewport Resizer. It's a Chrome extension. Yeah, if you use Google Chrome as your browser extension. I don't think it's built into developer tools, no. There, there are some pieces like that, but this one just puts a little bar right at the top to be able to click through. And, yeah, fi there's a Firefox developer edition that has more stuff built in. That, that could be it. Was there another question I saw? No. Um, yeah, and so we kind of work through from there. Again, just testing, trying all the, all the browsers, making it work. Um, using Genesis, there's a cool plugin called the Genesis Visual Hook Guide. Genesis has lots of hooks. It's kind of a geeky way to insert code different places. And it's hard to tell. They'll have all these hooks. You're like, where on earth will this one, you know, Genesis after header, where does that show up? If you enable this plugin, it just makes your site ugly and puts all the names of the hooks everywhere. And you think, oh, that's where it's going to go. Perfect. Go add the hook and work it in. But there's a lot of different plugins that can help with testing and, and development at that point. But that's some of what we've got there. Um, so it's been tested, reviewed. Everything's good. It's time to launch. Um, and we launch. Um, again, if this is a new site, we have that coming soon page. It's essentially just turn that off and the site becomes live for everyone. If it's on a staging server and they have an existing site, it's a whole different animal. Um, essentially what we do is move it on top of the old site and then make sure we have redirects set up for all the old pages. If they have you know, about.html for their old page and now it's just slash about, you want to make sure Google and visitors get the redirects. Um, there's a plugin called redirection, just very simply redirection that works well for that. Um, if you have a small site, what I often will do is as soon as we launch, I'll do a Google search for that site and just open up all the pages, which will all say 404 not found, and then go into the um, redirection plugin and say that one goes there, that one goes there, that one goes there, and that one goes there. Um, you know, it takes seconds to do. If it's a bigger site, you know, more traffic site, we have to build all that stuff ahead of time. You have to sort of know, it takes a little more finesse to make it work. Um, but launching our site, we have a checklist. We have slides from that from our meetup back in December. Um, a lot of these were kind of blowing through, so we've been using our meetup to kind of cover in depth some sections of it. Next month is going to be the wireframes and sitemaps for a longer stretch. But um, we have slides from December where we walk through our checklist for launching a site. We have 28 steps we go through. And they're all pretty easy, but it's, you know, make sure if it was on a test server, we said Google, go away. When we move it over, we say, Google, come on, come on in. You know, we've all, a lot of us have seen clients that accidentally left that one little silly checkbox checked that blocked Google completely from their site, um, which is so bad and so simple, but so easy to overlook because it's buried back in the settings. Uh, so we have a checklist we go through every time just to say, yeah, it's already cut off and just make sure we don't miss anything. And again, we've shared that checklist online. Um, there's a good book that came out, like the best marketing checklist ever that has checklists for all kinds of things. You know, we're big believers in that. Um, yeah. So we're launched and we're live. This is essentially done. The site is up. We still have a few more things we like to go through, though. Um, we like to educate and train our clients. You know, we, we believe in education. We're here in the meetup and that kind of thing. But even clients, if they don't care about WordPress, we like to train them to the extent at least they know what they have. I don't like people just to say, just we hope it works, you know. And if they want us to handle everything for them, that's great. We're happy to. But I still want to sit them down for a little while and say, here's how it works. Here's how you add pages. Here's how we add posts. So they can understand, oh, if you want to add a post, it's that easy. So they can just send us post to add. But if I want to change this, it's real hard. And so just to get them an understanding of what's going on. But of course, most clients want to just run it themselves afterwards, which is great. And so we're happy to, to educate on that um, and make that happen. Um, usually we do those in person. We do a lot of screencasts and that kind of thing, but the majority of our clients are local, and so we'll schedule some time just to sit down with them and their team to, to walk through how WordPress works and, you know, a, a condensed version of the beginner workshop from Friday um, with better Wi-Fi, hopefully. <laughs> you know, that, was, that was fun. Um, and then lastly, um, our improvements. You know, WordPress has a big update come out every month or so. Um, not as much lately, but often. Um, security updates on top of plugins that aren't always pushed out. We need to make sure people are staying updated somehow, whether they do it themselves, whether they use us, whether they use another service. Um, it happens. So we, we really stress that with people, you know, what do they need going on. Uh, we use a tool called Infinite WP to manage a whole bunch of sites at once. 
Uh, it's a pretty cool tool. The main WP folks are here. They have a great tool for that. Um, iThemes has a tool called iThemes Sync. Um, these are all tools. If you have a bunch of sites to manage, you can kind of look at them in one dashboard and work through instead of having to log into each one to see what's going on. Uh, Manage WP is one of the oldest, probably one of the best, uh, but one of the most expensive. Um, in our case, they would have been like 600 bucks a month to use, which is a lot to swallow for that. Um, but it's easy. Infinite WP that we use, you have to download it, install it on your own server, and set it up. It's a little more finicky, but then it's free once you use it. So um, different ways there. Um, have solutions like CodeGuard if you need backups. Uh, backup buddy. Just make sure all that kind of stuff's in place. If you just let a WordPress site sit, um, SEO is going to be not so good if you're not updating regularly, but you're going to get hacked at some point and just, you know, we like to make sure people are set one way or another, whether it's on their own, through us, through someone else. Um, it's an important piece just not to launch it and walk away. Um, and then, of course, we can help with new content and features, Google Analytics. You know, we always set up Google Analytics on a site even if they don't know or care what it is because invariably in six months they'll say, I just went to this conference and learned about Google Analytics. I want to see mine. And it's nice to say, well, we already had that set up here six months and they can dig in and look at data and stuff. Um, and then talk about other ways they may want to promote their new site, you know, social media, newsletters, lots of different stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so at that point, we're essentially done. There's a site for the world to see. And like I said, not all agencies use this process. Um, I know that there's larger agencies that do more of a, a team, a pod uh, kind of theory where they literally have a team about the size of ours dedicated to a single client. Um, you know, and that's, that's large scale. And then there's freelancers that, that it's just them. And you know, it's a lot to take on. But any adaption of this to really think through the strategy before getting to design and ultimately development is, is a wise choice. Um, so we are at greenmelonmedia.com, and you can find some of those meetup slides that we reference at allthingswordpress.com. We're happy to take questions as well. Thank you. Let me grab her real quick. Yes. Gotcha. So on some of those, like Gravity Forms, we'll have that in their name for them to take care of. Um, frankly, we have very few that don't have us handling updates. And we have the, the developer license for Genesis. We have it indefinitely. Um, but yeah, to the extent possible, if we are going to hand it off, we get as much as we can in their name to take care of. You know. And a lot of clients, we use WooFoo for the forms, um, which works well, has good and bad to it. Um, and that usually is through our name, so that's the one we want to put in there is if they want to go somewhere else, you know, to, to save them some cost. But that's, yeah, certainly something to be thinking about yeah, as you have premium themes and plugins and making sure it's, yeah, in their name. Good question. So, yeah, right in the back. What plugins do you generally load on all of the sites? I mean, what are some standard plugins that you use? For all right. So standard plugins that we use on all the sites, um, not many. I try to keep it as little as possible. We usually end up with eight or ten, and certainly it varies wildly. But a kismet on almost every site, because we do encourage people to blog and hopefully take comments on their site. That helps block spam. Um, there's one called Push Press I like to use, because it's a tiny little plugin that every time you post, it immediately notifies Google of it. Um, just another way to let Google know. It doesn't help you rank better, per se, but it, um, when you get, yeah, it gets you hopefully indexed quicker. Um, I'm a big believer in not worrying about people stealing your content. It is wrong. It's unethical. I don't recommend you do it. But I see people spend way too much time chasing all that down. Um, as long as you can be the authoritative copy of a post, if people copy it 20 times, you still rank first. That's cool. That plugin helps with that a little bit, just to say, hey, Google, we're first. If other people copy it, hopefully it'll help with that. Um, we use Jetpack most of the time. Um, not always, but again, it has a lot of great features. It enhances commenting. You know, it has some cool things where people can receive no email notifications of comments. As a user, I love um, going on another site to leave a comment and having that checkbox that says, email me when someone else replies. Because I'd like to start conversations, but I'm not going to remember to go back later and see. Um, so as a designer, as a you know, building a site, I want that checkbox there. Um, Jetpack has a number of cool features in there that help. Um, we built one last week called GM Block Bots. If any of you are in analytics, you probably see SE Malt and buttons for website and all that stuff. That blocks all those things. It's a tiny little 10-line plugin we added. Um, just to block all that kind of stuff from your Google Analytics. 
Um, WordPress SEO by Yoast. Um, there was a talk yesterday. We load that, again, virtually every time. And that's probably about it for every time. Again, there's others we'll add often, but you know, I don't want to say here's just the blanket plugins unique because it varies so much from case to case. So hope that helps. Yeah. Um, what tools, project management, do you use like to manage the tasks when you're building the site? Okay, so she's asking project management tools uh, for managing tasks. And actually, I just wrote a big blog post on our site about this a couple days ago. Uh, a few years ago, we used one called Nosebe, N-O-Z-B-E, which I know the Click host, what's that? Many years ago. Yeah, many years ago. I know the Click host folks do use it. It was a great product, nothing but good things to say about it. Uh, we switched to Asana about three years ago, and that's where I think a lot of people should be. Asana is phenomenal. Just had a few shortcomings. We got a little too big for them, and now we're using one called Teamwork.com. Similar to Basecamp, but Basecamp has a few killer missing holes. Um, recurring tasks is the main one for us. Um, somehow at Basecamp, you can't say every Monday do this. You have to use external stuff, and it's silly. Um, so teamwork.com is what we use. And again, I have a big post on our site explaining why we like that over Asana. And hopefully, I, I tried to write it in a way where people could say, well, that means I still like Asana better, because it is um, the biggest catch, I guess. Asana's free for pretty much anyone in here. I think you have to be over 30 users to pay. Teamwork, we're paying like 99 bucks a month. So that's a factor as well. Yeah. Oh, greenmelonmedia.com. All the everything you find on, on our site, yes. Uh, so just go there to the blog. We have Alley slides. I think are the first post, and a few down talking about teamwork. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So, how do you adapt your process when it's time for a redesign or refresh? Um, to a large degree, we don't. Um, typically, if they need a redesign, it's been years, and it really is time to sit back and think through the whole process again. It makes some steps easier. You know, they, they already have a site map in place. So we'll usually start with that. We'll put that into slick plan and say, all right, here's what you have. Now's the time. to let's, let's move this, and we need to expand this category. But you don't need this page anymore. And now we need copywriting done on these new pages and refresh it. And we want to give them a fresh layout. And so to a large degree, it, it, it doesn't change much. Again, it can go a little quicker, perhaps. But we try not to. Again, if we assume all the copy's good from before, well, maybe, maybe not. You know, SEO might not be good. So it's worth, yeah, worth taking a whole fresh look at it. Okay, how do we put, what do we put in our contract for training and maintenance? Um, we put in with every site we build, we give them two, usually two hours of trainings included. We'll, we'll go to them so that can be on their computers with their team and show them. Depending what they need, we may put in four hours instead if we think they want to know more. Um, and usually I say that, I go there with a list, I have a list of what we go through in WordPress, but I say, this is your time, you know, we'll talk about WordPress, but if you want to talk about analytics, sometimes we get into talking about teamwork in Asana, I mean, it's really whatever they want to learn from us there. And then ongoing, we give them options. We have some plans where we say, here's our basic plan where we'll do WordPress updates and backups and plugin updates and malware scans and all that kind of stuff. And then if they need extra help each month, and then it gets into newsletters and other, you know, those are all custom. You know, we kind of just talk through it with them and see what needs to happen. Nikki. Then they're not our clients. <laughs> I mean, because again, they, they don't need us. They're not going to pay what they need to pay for a site. They need to use a Wix or something else, so they just want to throw a site up, and, and that's okay. You know, people don't always have the time or budget to, to do it what we would consider the right way. And so, and we'll, we'll talk to other folks. Um, Cliff Seal and Kyle have a product called Evermore, you may have heard him mention. It's kind of a little bit cheaper, easier way to do it. Not thinking through everything, but we know it's on a, you know, a good, solid platform. They use Genesis, does a good job there. Um, so yeah, we just kind of talk through what their other options might be then, because that's not what we want to do. Okay, so a kismet, yeah, to use a kismet for anti-spam, you need a key. Um, and they kind of hide. If you go to say, I need a key, you can get it for free, but they say, pay five bucks for it, and you can kind of slide it to free if you want. Uh, we do, we slid it up to like 50 bucks a month we pay, just because I want to give back to that. I mean, we do use it quite a lot. So, yeah, we have a, a paid key for ours. But if you're a personal site, you can go in, and when you get the key, it's going to say, pay for it, and you can slide it and say, make it free. But if you're doing a business, I certainly encourage you to toss them a couple bucks a month, because it is a, a great plug in to block spam. <laughs> No, we, we, we just take care of that. Yeah, we, have, we just use the one key. I believe it's acceptable. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're paying for the one, one key. I think we're paying enough, and we just use it for all our clients. You know, so. Um, other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yep, design. Do we have in Design. Yeah. She's... You're asking what we use to design the site once the wireframe's done? Yes, seven. Are you already building it on? 
still presenting layouts? Good question. We, we do still use Photoshop to design. A lot of people design in the browser. That's okay too. If you are a designer and developer, you might be comfortable doing that. Um, we take that wireframe that I've done in Illustrator, we move it over to Photoshop, and we literally start you know, filling it in. Um, it, so yes, there's certainly different ways you can do that. I know people who have designed sites in Illustrator if it's going to be a very cartooned, animated site. So different tools. But. Right, right, and that's, that's more during the testing phase where we'll actually see it all come to life. Um, we, when we have more complex projects, sometimes we overlap design and development a bit so that they can see, here's the home page and here's how it would work. Um, animation or, right. right, yes, and we can show that in, in, in the actual testing phase and maybe give them a premature look at it. Um, but oftentimes we'll explain it. Sometimes I even put little um, notations in the PDF that say this is going to do this action. Um, and the, um, the, the thing that sideways eight uses with the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you can actually do a whole document about exactly what actions are going to happen on the website. Um, we don't do that, but I, I know agencies that do. Yeah, I was going to say one other piece that once the wireframe is done, um, design begins, but really development can start to begin at that point because we know exactly the layout. So start building the columns and widget areas and start getting it laid out. So once design's done, we can roll it in, uh, depending on our workload and stuff. But yeah, we'll do that sometimes too. Yeah. Envision. For design. Okay. Okay. Okay, Envision is what he's saying. We've not used that. I'm not familiar with it, but certainly worth looking at. Cool. Others? Cool. Yeah. So what's your like, philosophy about video on the homepage? I mean, you know, we just left a big video session. Okay, our philosophy about but video on the homepage. Either. Don't auto play. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I think the one is I don't like pop-ups. For the most part, there are tasteful ways. We heard in the keynote yesterday, so, you know, the the friendly pop-up or whatever, but video I don't like to pop up and I never, never autoplay. I mean, we have some sites where at the top they have a beautiful video, so we feature it right on top of the homepage if, we, if that's a big call to action, but I never like to autoplay, mostly for user behavior. If someone's at work sneaking around trying to look at your resort or whatever, and the music starts, they don't look for the pause, they just X out of the browser and they're gone, maybe never to come back, so and it's just annoying, and I do the same thing, you know. Sure, yeah, there we go, please. Embedded, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Exactly, and that, that's what we like. Yeah, let the users have the choice. And this is one of the things where clients don't always get in the head of their users. They say, we want it to pop up and annoy them and get them, but we say, but they hate that when other sites do it. And you gotta, you gotta think what would the clients actually wanna see. And you know, a large video, if it's, it's going to attract attention. If people want to play it, they will. And if they don't want to, then you would have annoyed them even more otherwise. So, Did you, know. Did you have a question? Uh, favorite caching plugin? Often is none. Um, we don't always cache every site. A lot of our clients just don't get that much traffic, and caching is going to break more things than it fixes. Um, W3 Total Cache. I mean, there's a number of decent ones out there we'll use on bigger sites, but it's more of a case by case, but not, not consistently. Again, especially if a client's going to be managing it later, there's too many things that can blow up. Uh, Cliff Seals talked yesterday, talked about ways to hide a lot of that from them, which would help a little bit so they're not playing with the settings and enhancing it for us. But um, yeah, again, a lot of our clients, they'll get 50, 100 visits a day. It's not going to make a big difference. Um, it's more, more hassle than it's worth. But there are, there are good ones out there, and I'm not really the expert on that. You know, we take it case by case, research what we need to get done. <laughs> Anyone else? I see one back there. Nope. Uh, you had mentioned hacking and that some of your clients are getting hacked. Can you just please talk a little bit more about that and the types of customers that are... Okay, so hacking, things? yes. Um, so yeah, so WordPress being the most popular in the world has hackers always trying to attack it because they can find a hole in. They suddenly have a hole to 73 million sites or whatever. Um, over Christmas, for example, there was a revolution slider had a, a hole in it. Uh, something where around 150,000 sites got hacked. I mean, hackers will do their best to get into your site and then usually do their best to disguise that they got in. The days of a skull and crossbones are over because then you fix it. You know, they'll just slip little Viagra links in and do things and you'll just see your traffic tailing off and not know why. Um, but WordPress comes out with updates very frequently to combat that. Um, you know, WordPress SEO had a pretty decent 
security hole last week they fixed. Um, we just encourage clients just to keep it secure. In our case, we keep it secure, we keep plugins updated, we still do a malware scan every week. We still, we use iThemes security for an extra security plugin. Uh, WordFence does a good job, Security does a good job. There's a lot of good security plugins. We get something in place on the site, not only to protect it further, which theoretically you don't need if you're updated, but you never know, always an extra layer of defense. Um, and then again, we do a weekly malware scan. Infinite WP has a feature where it'll scan, we can just say scan all of our sites. It'll run through and tell us what's going on. Yeah, yeah, we, we keep uptime monitoring on too. That was one I didn't mention. Uh, there's uptime robots. You can set that up for free and say, check my site every five minutes. If it goes down, text me or email me or whatever. That one's pretty cool. I switched away from that one. It's free, which I, you can't beat anywhere. Because if a site went down just for a second, it would text me. So I got a lot of texts and started to tune them out. So we use one now called port dash monitor, um, which I can say, check it every five minutes. And if it's down three times in a row, then text me, because now there's really a problem. So I get far fewer texts, but I'm, they're much more urgent. I know something's going on. Um, again, it's the kind of thing a host probably is taking care of, but you know, maybe it's something, a plugin update or something went sideways and no one noticed. So you know, I, I want to know about something down before. Um, but yeah, hacking, I don't know if there was a security talk this year. There's often a whole talk on security, because that's a whole bigger issue. If you've talked to any of the hosts out there, they can, they can certainly speak more to why they're just the most secure platform and what they do. So. Others? Cool. Awesome. Yeah, check us out. But um, enjoy lunch. Thank you, guys. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy lunch.